Well, good morning, church. It's good to be with you. I'm having mic issues here. All right. Um, Got to get dressed uh, for everybody here. So it's uh, uh, good to see you today. Uh, welcome to First United Methodist Church to those of you who are gathered here with us and those of you who are gathered here online. Uh, it's a joy to be with you. I want to welcome everybody online who's joining us for the 830 service and those of you who are joining us well for the 11 o'clock hour. We're uh, only able to film the, the 830 service today as we just had some complications with COVID and exposure. And uh, so thank you, Will, for being here and postponing his vacation just a little bit to make sure we can get this uh, online. So we are uh, grateful to be here uh, and to get to worship, especially on the heels of, of Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, uh, the hope of, of Jesus Christ. And so uh, we're so grateful that we're, we get a chance to continue uh, our, our life of worship together as the church. And so as we do that, let us stand and let us sing together. Together. Good morning, church. We're going to sing some familiar Christmas songs starting with Angels from the Realms of Glory.
our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we have done what we have always done. We have lit the Advent candles one by one, sharing scripture that prepares us for your arrival. We have sung the songs that remind us of your humble beginnings. And in our mind's eyes, we saw the angels singing as the shepherds watched in both awe and fear of the unknown. But Lord, it is in that moment in the temple as Simeon speaks to Mary and Joseph, describing what lies ahead for you. I can't imagine their concern. They can't imagine what your future looks like. Lord, I think this is where we often lose our way. We can't see our future path clearly in the midst of all that is happening. Our faith is good at celebrating with a straight and narrow ritual. The song sung, the candles lit, and parables read. But we're not as good in the off-road journeys. We don't invite you in for ourselves or others, even though we know that our nation faces unemployment without benefits by the millions. Clear a path to see us through this, Lord. Our nation is hitting an all-time high in COVID cases and our local hospitals are beginning to reach closer and closer to full capacity. Clear a path to see us through this, Lord. Some of us are still ill at ease about how the family Christmas celebration went down. Whether you did not see the family you wanted to or you saw too many, or they refuse to ma wear masks altogether. <clears throat> or maybe, just maybe, we just missed seeing someone so much it hurt. Clear a path to see us through this, Lord. We often forget that these off-road paths are the reason for faith in the first place. To believe that no matter what happens, you are always there, guiding us through the most difficult times. And though we know the hardest times, all the way through it, strengthen us, Lord. Build our faith. 
bring us closer to you. And at times it feels almost too heavy to bear. Walk with us, carry us when needed. Remind us that we are never alone, no matter what time of year it is. Because in you there is hope, in you there is peace, in you there is joy. And now let us say the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. scripture today comes from Luke chapter 2. And so we invite you, if you have your Bible with you or at home, to turn there. We'll be looking at verses 22 uh, all the way through 38. Um, you know, as we 
continue the narrative of, of Jesus and Luke's gospel, uh, we find that we've already left the manger um, and even the naming of Jesus that took place eight days after his birth, as was customary by the law. And we make our way um, here to the temple as Joseph and Mary bring Jesus to be dedicated before the Lord some 40, 42 days after Jesus' birth. And so let's listen here for the word of the Lord. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. And so moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the failing, uh, the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old, and she had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then she was a widow until she was 84. She had never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, every Advent, we tell stories about all of the people who go to visit Jesus. We spend most of our time talking about uh, the various visits from the angels. We look at Joseph and Mary who were present there at the manger. We go on to look at at the shepherds and their news, and we look at, at the magi and their gifts. We love to sit in the stories of those who marveled in the moment of Jesus' birth. But what we can easily forget is just how many failed to see it. I mean, it seems kind of odd to us, doesn't it? With the Savior of the world being born into the world and almost the entire world missing it. And it can be very easy from our vantage point in history with the story kind of in front of us and preserved to to look at these people and think, well, how in the world could you miss something as monumental as the movement of God in Jesus coming down to us? But there's a part of this 
that, that I find kind of disconcerting. And it really makes me wonder as I look more inward just how many times have I missed the Lord's movement in my own life? How many times have we as a church missed God's presence and work in our life together? And we don't just see it there at the manger or in Bethlehem as many people miss it. We see it here in the temple as well as Joseph and Mary bring Jesus to be dedicated before the Lord. On any ordinary day in the temple, thousands of people would have flooded into and out of the temple. And it here on this day with Jesus being present there only to take notice. Simeon and Anna. Now, the first one to come across Jesus and recognize him was a man named Simeon. And Luke gives us a few kind of descriptions here of Simeon. And here's what he, he wants to highlight about who Simeon was. He says, Simeon was righteous and devout. He was waiting on the redemption of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. Now, it would be a worthy effort, endeavor, to kind of go about and to pick apart each of these things that Luke names about Simeon. Uh, but today, for our efforts, we're going to really focus on one of them. And it's the one that might seem perhaps the most odd or out of place when it comes to this description of him. And it's the idea that, that Simeon is described as someone who is waiting that he's waiting specifically for the redemption of, of Israel, of his people. He's waiting on the salvation that he knows that God is bringing about into the world. Now, that has to seem kind of an odd way to describe somebody, and I'm willing to bet you've never chosen to describe someone in your life as someone who is waiting. I mean, it seems especially out of place in, in our world because, you know, we live in this kind of fast-paced, instant gratification world that doesn't have much room for waiting. We look at waiting as an inconvenience or a, a waste of time, and because of that, we never choose to share this news about somebody, especially in any kind of positive light. Yet, when we scan the whole of Scripture, uh, we find that actually there's, there's a value to be found in waiting. Especially in waiting on the Lord. You see, the scriptures begin to look at, at waiting, especially on waiting in the Lord, and the scriptures view this as a, a really an act of trust. That looking upon the Lord with the expectation that God is moving is a way of saying, I believe that God, you are living and active, and I'm going to wait because I expect you to do something and to do something great. And so waiting is a show of trust. And we find Simeon here is, is someone who is waiting. But it's not only the reality that he is waiting that makes a difference. It's, it's how we find him waiting. You see, all of us know what it is to wait and, and to simply pass the time by. When we're waiting on something that we deem really unimportant, we're just hoping the time moves on so we can get past the waiting. But, but there's this other form of waiting in which we're waiting for something great to happen. And when we're waiting on something monumental, you know, there's this kind of eager anticipation that builds in us. And it doesn't cause a kind of nervous anxiety as much as it just cause, causes an attentiveness to what is going on around us. 
And, you know, it heightens our awareness. And if anything, we see more and live more in the moment. You know, I think a great illustration of this kind of waiting was what every kid did here just a few days ago on Christmas morning. You know, I don't know about y'all with your kids or grandkids, but man, the Johnson household, we've been counting down Christmas for 12 days beforehand. And you could feel just that anticipation begin to build. And, you know, God bless my wife because she's remembered what's happened on Christmas morning uh, the past few years. Um, And so she had to make a deal with our oldest child. You know, Kinsley is the morning person. Emerson can sleep like her dad, but, but boy, you know, Kinsley, she wakes up in the morning, and especially Christmas morning. And my wife remembers her bursting down through the door at 5 a.m. On, on Christmas morning, you know, just rearing and ready to go. And, and so Annie made a deal with, with Kinsley on Christmas Eve. She said, look, um, I, I know you're probably going to wake up early, but you can't come into our room until there's blue in the sky. And you may think, well, that's kind of weird to say blue in the sky, but I know what she was doing. You see, when, when light first dawns, um, that's a little bit earlier, like what, about 6.30 right now? Um, but it's not about 15 minutes later until you get some blue in the sky, right? So she's trying to buy us just a little bit more sleep time on, on Christmas morning. And, and so thank you, uh, honey, for that. And today's her birthday, by the way, so happy birthday uh, if you're watching. Uh, but. But sure enough, when that blue hit the sky, in that moment, our daughter came kicking in the doors of our bedroom. And before I could even say, Kinsley, it is too early, um, she said, no, there's blue in the sky, and she got to work. (laughs) You know, she had half her gifts open before I could even get out of bed. You know, later we asked her when she woke up, and she didn't have any idea, but she woke up in the middle of the night and it was dark. Instead of going back to sleep out of eager anticipation, she sat with her eyes peeled out her window, waiting in the dark for the dawn to break and for the sky to fill with blue. And the moment she did, the moment it did, She was ready. I think this is a great way of of looking at Simeon and the kind of waiting that he was doing for the salvation of the Lord. You see, Simeon wasn't just sitting by going, I'm sure God will take care of something at some point in time. Instead, he was actively engaged in the process of waiting that his spiritual posture of, of looking upon the Lord and seeking the Lord heightened his awareness to the coming salvation that would be his and that of his people. And so he waited with his eyes peeled for the coming of the Lord. And the moment that he did, Simeon was ready because the waiting had prepared him. It had readied him to recognize and receive Jesus in the moment that he would appear. And so Simeon saw and he came and he blessed because he was readied and he recognized. And we see something really similar here in the prophetess and Anna. In the same way that we're given just a brief description of Simeon, so we're, we're given just a few insights into Anna, and, and, and they seem kind of odd when you, you put them together. It says that she lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Luke tells us two primary things about Anna, that she was a widow and a worshiper. A widow and a worshiper. 
we might look at those and think, well, how did those two meet? And why would you tell us these two things about her, that she's a widow and a worshiper? But I think Luke includes these things as if to say that Anna was someone who was dedicated to the Lord. She was someone who was seeking after the Lord with her eyes set upon her, that she gave much of her life to a steady acts of devotion that sought to ready her for the moment in time of Jesus' coming. I mean, even Luke sees it. He says, in the moment that Jesus was there, Anna shows up. That her acts of piety and fasting and praying, and I imagine, though it's not said, kind of diving into the scriptures, these acts of devotion readied her and gave her a posture of, of recognition so when Jesus came, she would be ready. She was a widow, but a worshiper. What I love about Anna and her story is that Anna reminds us that worship is not reserved for a particular time and place. It's a lifestyle. Worship isn't something that we come to do. It's not something that we watch. Worshiping is something, it's who we are as children of God. And that part of actively waiting on the Lord is worshiping. I mean, that's what we've come to do here today. It's an, it's an active waiting upon the Lord to move. It's, we've come here to recognize after the season, the heels of the season of Advent, that Jesus has indeed moved and come into our world. But part of our worshiping is an anticipation of his coming back to us again of that great movement of Jesus to come here upon the earth and to take this as his kingdom and make it rightfully his own, to establish a kingdom here on the earth of righteousness and justice. So part of our worshiping is awaiting on this movement of the Lord. It's a readying of our hearts to receive. It heightens our anticipation and our awareness of the movements of God that exist here in the world today because we know that Jesus isn't just coming, but that he's here and moving in the world and that the restoration that he will bring is being foreshadowed by the restoration and redemption of lives here and now upon the earth. And so part of our activity as the church is to be watching and waiting so that we might participate in the workings of God here and now. And we're looking at it this out of these two characters today because I think it's an important message for the church to hear. You know, we live in a culture that values going and doing, not waiting. And I think there are many of us in the church that if we're really honest with ourselves, we feel more comfortable going and doing something and calling it the Lord's than we do actually waiting on him. That there's an anxiousness that builds up in us when we wait. And yet as a church, we are called to not only wait on the Lord to move, but to be watchers of his movements, to be those with our eyes peeled to the window for God's movement in our lives and in our life together. And we watch with anticipation because we believe, we have faith that God is moving in our world and we wanna see it when it happens so that we can join God and actively participate in his movements.
You know, it's not always an easy thing for us to wait. It's not always an easy thing for us to identify where and how God is moving. But I was reminded of the power of it this past Sunday. You know, we had kind of come up with the idea as a staff of, of caroling and something we've done every year as a church. It's not a new practice for us, but obviously this year with COVID, it made it a challenge. And usually we ride in cars and travel in groups, and that just wasn't really safe or possible this year. And so uh, we kind of came up with the idea of, well, what if we went and caroled over to our friends at the Midlothian Assisted Living, Midtown Assisted Living across the way? And uh, there was something about the idea that kind of drew us into it, and we originally planned it on a Wednesday night, but uh, as we saw the forecast of 30 degrees and the wind blowing, we knew that, well, that's going to pose a challenge for us getting out there and people wanting to be out there. And we usually don't have big numbers when it comes to caroling anyways, and so we saw this as problematic, and so the idea was, well, maybe we'll just scrap it, you know, and, and not do that this year. Um, but there was something about it as we talked that just felt compelling. And we thought, well, it might be inconvenient this time of year. It might be late and maybe not a lot come, but we just feel like we need to do this. And so last Sunday at 5 o'clock, we gathered over in the parking lot across the way, and we made our way to the Midtown Assisted Living Center. We walked into kind of the courtyard area where there's double doors that open to the places where the residents eat and a number of the residents' uh, windows. Well, we got there and no one was there to greet us. <laughs> Nobody, like no windows were open, no residents down there. We didn't even see people who were working. And so we gathered around and we stood there and kind of wondered like, do we start singing? You know, like, what do we do here? And so Paul began to lead us in caroling to no one. <laughs> and so we, we begin singing, and, 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 uh, and sure enough, we get through the first song, and still we haven't seen a soul yet. And, and as a pastor who's always reviewing the events as they're playing, I'm thinking, man, this is a bust. Uh, we told them we were coming. We thought they were ready. Like, this is a bust, and it's embarrassing, you know? And, and I'm just thinking, like, how can we back out of this thing slowly and kind of save face? But as we begin into the second song, we see the blinds to the room of one of the residents open. A nurse had pulled them up and moved the resident close to the window. And we saw the first looks of wonder. Her face lights up and she begins to point at the children who are running around and playing. And then we see another. And another. Before long, the residents who show up to dinner early started to come down and took notice of our scene. And instead of going to their tables to eat, they came closer to the double doors. And one resident after another came down to sit and just receive, to be loved and blessed in a time when it's easy to feel for them forgotten. And somehow this moment that I had worried at once was a failure became a holy and sacred moment filled with a movement of a God who's not just going to come and redeem in the future, but is acting here and now, you know, sometimes it can be hard to see when the Lord moves until it isn't, until it just becomes undeniable. And so in this season and in every season, May we as a church be readied to receive and recognize the movement of God in our life. 
We can't afford to miss it. Instead, let's see it and join God in his redemptive work in this world. I invite you to pray with me. Lord, if we're being honest, we have likely missed many of the times that you have showed up in our life. The many times that you have acted in our world or called us to participate in life with you and we just failed flat out to see it. But we pray, Lord, as we come together as a church, as we worship, as we enter this posture of waiting, that, Lord, you would heighten our awareness to how and where you are moving in the world. That you would help us not only see it and recognize it, but Lord, you'd help us to respond faithfully by joining you in your work. Let us not just get caught up in trying to do your things or trying to do this or that, albeit good. Instead, let us do the things you are doing, where you and your spirit and power are moving to bring about true redemption and restoration. So please, please give us a, a collective spirit of discernment. Open our eyes and fill our hearts with a spirit of courage and obedience that we might go and do the very things that you are doing. Amen. Church, let's stand together as we sing once in Royal David City. joining us in, in worship today. Uh, we have just really kind of a couple announcements. Obviously, we're moving toward the very end of the year. The office still uh, is, is, well, uh, the doors are, are closed uh, as far as people being in the church. But if you need to get in by appointment, our staff is working remotely and we can come in based on appointment. So be sure if you have any business that you would like to attend to at the end of the year, uh, be sure to email the office or myself or uh, one of the staff and you can certainly make an appointment. We'd love uh, to meet you and be here with you. But uh, we, we get to continue our worship from this place. We know again, it's not relegated just to this time and place and worship isn't stopping for us. Instead, our worship continues. Uh, it continues by our giving, which you can do as you exit the church or by clicking on a link there in our comment section uh, if you're online with us. Uh, but our worship continues far beyond here. Uh, and it's not just relegated to our financial gifts, which is an important part of our giving, but it's, it's only a part of it. We leave this place giving our lives over, being dedicated as Anna was to the Lord's work in our life, to be watching and waiting as Simeon 
knowing that God is moving in the world and we want to be ready to know it and see it. And so uh, as we leave this place, let's leave as worshipers who are waiting and anticipating the movements of God in our life. Amen.